Okay, cool. So looks like we are live. Uh, just got confirmation there. Awesome. Well, thanks for everyone for joining. Um, today is our, our first go round at Ask Me Anything. Uh, my name is Travis. I am the CEO of FlexPoint. Um, you know, I've got one of these questions. It's perfect. We put it at the top of what we do. So I'll, I'll dive into more about FlexPoint and uh, what we do. But today really is about uh, basically asking any question that you have on your mind around the company, around me personally, around our software. I'm um, not going to do like a full screen share or anything like that today, but happy to talk through anything, point in the right, right direction if it's a more technical question. Um, and then, yeah, just give you the opportunity to kind of, you know, uh, meet me more personally and then just talk through these kind of questions. I do have, it looks like we had 13 or 14 um, questions submitted uh, all you know, prior to this, this webinar, but we are going to be taking live ones. I will address all the live ones that come through here. I'll try to address as many that we have already here from what you submitted when you registered. So happy to do that. Um, all right, cool. Well, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started here and start reading off the questions that were submitted and, and answering. Um, awesome. So the first one, super simple, super easy, uh, you know, kind of a layup here, but it looks like Karen from uh, right here in St. Augustine, she says, I would like to know what your company does. I am an eBay and Amazon seller located in St. Augustine. So Karen, to, to answer that, um, really, you know, FlexPoint is a, it's a drop ship uh, automation platform. You know, we, we do a lot of different things. We do more than just drop ship, but we really focused on the, the drop shipper, the retailer that is reselling products. Um, we can be used as an order management system, inventory management system, a general e-commerce operations platform is, you know, we've been described as as well. Uh, but basically we're going to help you manage your inventory and your orders, um, across multiple sources of inventory, whether it's from your drop ship suppliers, your own warehouse, uh, and then selling and listing them on multiple channels, whether it's eBay and Amazon like yourself or your own Shopify store, uh, whatever it might be. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we're that central hub that kind of makes, makes sure that all of the data, all the orders, the inventory is in sync, everything's kind of flowing back and forth and keeping your business running. Um, we have a couple other businesses under the umbrella of uh, what's technically called Inventory Source. Inventory Source is, uh, is another company of ours with a product which is a directory of uh, online dropship suppliers or dropship suppliers, I should say in general, where uh, we have this pre-built integrated directory and you can automatically connect into this directory of dropship suppliers, sync inventory and orders. That's one of our companies. Uh, US Direct is another sister company of ours where we give you access to, I believe it's over 100,000 product SKUs that are dropship ready from the top distributors in the US. Um, we make it really easy where you're actually buying through us, we're buying from the drop shipper, we're facilitating all the technology through inventory source, and it's basically instant access, instant approval to 100,000 plus products that you wanna sell and drop ship. So a um, couple different companies there, but really our main focus today and in general is FlexPoint. It's, uh, it's you know, more of that order management system, um, e-commerce operations platform that allows you to just run your business uh, your own warehouse inventory, your dropship inventory, multiple channels, um, everything is synced up in one central platform. Um, all right, cool. Next one is, uh, hi, Travis, I'm new at this. I currently sell on Shopify. Shopify, Shopify has their own CSV template to upload products, right? So they have their own template that you upload products into Shopify. Um, I have five suppliers. All of them, I have used CSVs to upload their products to my store. Okay, so this is a, it sounds like a retailer, right? A reseller of goods. Shop store, he or she, or she, I guess, has uh, five suppliers that <clears throat> they have their own CSVs that they're going to upload to her store to be able to um, sync inventory or add new products directly to the store. And then she says, what is the best way and cost effective way to automate this? Um, so, there's a, to answer this question, there's a couple of different things and I'm going to be as, you know, unbiased and as impartial as possible. Um, you know, there's some really cheap options out there uh, in the Shopify app store that you can simply just take a CSV and, and sync it to your store. Um, you know, if you just search in Shopify app store, there's like little simple syncing apps that will do just that. Uh, you probably even use Zapier. If you're not familiar with Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R. 
um, you know, that's a great platform that we, we use for a couple of things here. You could probably do it pretty cost effectively, even free to some case, um, you know, our main value proposition at FlexPoint and inventory source in a lot of cases is sinking this inventory, but we're really for that, you know, if, if the more experienced reseller that has got a lot more problems uh, than just sinking inventory, um, where it's, you know, whether it's syncing up invoices, routing orders, um, you know, automatically uh, making decisions on where to send the order, things like that, um, syncing pro full product data and, uh, and bringing that into your system and modifying it right? We're a little bit more enterprise than like a simple sync app. But, um, you know, you may run into with certain uh, sync apps that you might find that just sync a CSV to your website. The biggest issue you might run into is uh, if you've got the same product from multiple suppliers or you carry that product and your supplier also carries that product. So I sell Logitech mice because uh, I have an electronic store and I buy those in bulk and I keep those in my own warehouse. And I also have an agreement with Logitech to drop ship the exact same mouse. Um, when I run out of my stock, they'll drop ship uh, orders for me. If that's the case, you're going to run into issues when you're trying to sync, you know, do, just directly sync a, uh, a supplier CSV. That's where like a FlexPoint product might come in and help uh, automatically merge those products together, create one listing, you know, aggregate the quantity, average the cost, whatever it might be. Um, but if it's simply just getting products into your store, there's no overlap in product. There's no uh, inventory quantity um, kind of aggregation or anything like that. Uh, then you can, I think Syncio is one to look at. Like I said, Zapier is another system that might be able to pull uh, files. Um, those files, you know, the big thing to think about is a lot of times they might not be, you know, if they're emailed to you automatically, you're going to set up some kind of automation to get those um, down off an email. If your vendors just simply provide them to you, uh, ad hoc and um, in another way, it could be a Dropbox link or whatever, you know, you have to look around and see what makes the most sense. But um, like I said, Syncio is a real cheap option, Zapier, another option to look at. So the best way, most cost effective way, best way to answer that is depends on your use case. If it's a separate file, very simple file, I would go in the Shopify app store um, and that's going to be the most cost effective way as well. If you have more complex needs, FlexPoint is obviously something that you can look at. All right. Cool. We got just checking to see if we have any questions in here yet. I'm not sure. I'm going to pull up and make sure that uh, I can see the questions as they come through. Melanie, if you can uh, ping me those, if you see one come through, let me know. I'm, I'm got the two screens going here. Um, yep. Okay. I can see your message, Ahmed. Uh, so yeah, anything you post in there, I can see. All right. <clears throat> So the third question here, you collaborate and observe many companies operating in the e-commerce sales market. Have you noticed any interesting novelty recently, a new business model, anything that came as a surprise? Uh, I'm going to try to pronounce the name. Hopefully I don't butcher it if, you, if you're on. Uh, Tadeus, I, I think, is the best way to pronounce that. So uh, Tadeus, yeah, I really like this question. Um, you know, I was hoping to kind of answer some of these outside of the, the typical product uh, technical questions that we get. You know, this one is, uh, I would say the first thing that jumped out of my mind was the marketplace model is picking up significantly. Um, we've seen some really large uh, traditional brands roll out the marketplace model. Um, we did not end up working with them. Uh, this is about two years ago, but we've, we've worked with a couple others and we've, we've seen uh, uh, this happen, but it's worth mentioning because it's a fairly large name, Brook Linen. Is a, is a brand that we saw that, you know, is rolling out a market or has rolled out a marketplace model um, that was uh, super interesting to see and, and, and a trend that we have seen. We've rolled out other ones for other customers. I don't want to bring up their name just from, from confidentiality perspective, but, um, you know, we've, we've rolled out this as well, where marketplace models and being a brand who wants to bring on other brands, essentially, um, that offer, com, uh, you know, complementary products that are going to allow you to, you know, draw more people into your, your platform, give more of a unique offering, like in Brooklyn's case, right? It's all like linen and sheets and pillowcases. If they can kind of like do a shop the look approach with like a, a lamp and a desk and things like that, that's, they're obviously not going to go and start procuring and bringing in a bunch of desks and lamps to their warehouse. You know, they, they want to leverage the marketplace and the dropship model for that. So we see that more and more, um, 
we see that being a big piece of, of, of the market of the marketplace being the marketplace model going forward. So I think that's a, a big one that popped up. Um, you know, we've seen the, the social selling and the live selling is really is getting larger. Um, we've had a couple uh, customers come through really pushing the live selling, um, you know, almost like the home shopping network type vibe, uh, but it, it kind of reinvented. So that's been interesting too. Um, yeah, I'd say that's that's been the, the two primary ones that really jump out at me that I've, I've seen as of late. All righty, uh, Andrew, so what is the process for onboarding suppliers that aren't set up initially with live inventory, digital order, receiving, et cetera? So Andrew asked, basically, if you want to onboard a supplier, they don't have live inventory, they don't receive orders digitally, you know, or basically automatically, how do you, how do you onboard them? Um, well, it's, it, it has to start with a conversation. It's a business partnership. You have to start with a conversation with your supplier on a couple of things. And this is one that we try to help our, our customers with and help drive this conversation where we can. But basically you're asking, here's our options. You know, we want to send you orders automatically. We want to uh, sync inventory. Our options are to send these. Well, let's start with inventory to pull inventory from some system that you have and, and make things as easy as possible for you and less, less friction you setting up anything on your side. Me as a retailer, reseller, talking to a brand, a supplier, a wholesaler, right? Uh, when I say that, they're going to say, well, you know, we're on Shopify or we're on NetSuite or we're on this system or X, Y, and Z system. How do I pull, you know, what do you mean you want to pull my inventory? Well, you know, basically you'd say, well, do you... One, do you provide a fee to anyone already? And if they say, no, we've never done this before, we want to work with you, but we don't know how to do it, you know, then, then you start going to the path of talking about their systems. If they have done it, ask how they've done it in the past. A lot of times they have provided a feed and export in some way, but if they don't have that inventory today, as Andrew, you asked, you could say, well, if you're using something like FlexPoint, you can, you can basically say, if you're on Shopify, if you're on Big Commerce, if you're on a couple of these other platforms we integrate with, just give me an API key. We'll be able to pull inventory directly out of our system, out of your system. You don't have to set anything up on your side. And then from there, you can, uh, you know, you can, you can provide them a portal, which, you know, PlexPoint's got a vendor portal. There's other systems out there that have vendor portals where they can kind of dictate what products they want you to sell and not sell. Um, so it makes it really easy for them. If they don't want to, if they want to be extremely hands off and just say, I don't want to have to do anything. I can't get approval from my boss, whatever on, on setting up anymore. I don't have any budget. Basically, you just say, let us connect. If you're one of these four or five different uh, supported platforms, we can pull the inventory directly out and we'll sync inventory and we'll be able to feel good about the orders we send you that are, are actually in stock. Um, that's step one. Step two, maybe they're not a supported platform. They don't feel comfortable with you integrating directly into their system, right? Uh, you can talk through, okay, well, are you willing to update inventory into our system manually? And then that's where the vendor portal comes in. Um, basically, you know, we can't integrate your system. So we need to know what you have in stock. And if you can do an export, if you can manually check and then manually update, you know, it's going to be a lot tougher depending on what scenario you're in. We do have many, many customers that their brands and their suppliers want their orders. They have a big enough name or audience to, to allow, you know, the vendors to, uh, or at least to persuade the vendors to manually go and update, you know, uh, inventory as well as receive orders to be a vendor portal. But that's typically the way that you would onboard a supplier who does not have any automation is through a vendor portal. The biggest hurdle is convincing the vendor to do it. A lot of these, these brands and suppliers, they already do it for the large names out there. They don't have automation set up. Um, it's not easy to do it, whatever. So they might even have a team that logs into four different portals every single morning and updates tracking information and inventory. So it might not that be that big of a deal, um, but that is typically how you start the conversation. We've applied, they don't want to do that by store. They're on a big commerce store. We can easily just integrate with them with a little, little need for them to do much. All righty. Um, okay. So next one we have here, what is the process for onboarding supplier? Oh, no, sorry. We just did that one. How do you handle media transferred over API on a granular level? Do customers get the option to select whether or not they can resize those images in transit? and or select specific product images so as to not overload their servers. Um, so this is one where I will attempt to answer it. I don't, 
I might speak, you know, out of, uh, out of, you know, my level uh, of my, my pay, pay grade, essentially, you know, I might want to get my CTO on exactly how this works, but, you know, I know there's a, we will store down images. We will bring down images into our system. Um, and so we can pull an API, let's say in an API, there's a link to an image hosted somewhere. Or even in some cases, we will integrate with a zip file on a Dropbox location or individual files on a Dropbox folder, right? Either way, we're getting images into our system. We will actually cache them down and store those images in our system. I believe we store them in the original. The sizing part is where I'm not completely sure. I believe we store them in the original sizing. Um, we may do some translation within the app to get the sizing uh, in, a, in a more centralized format. And then when it comes to listing them, I, I do believe we have some channel specific um, image dimension kind of integrations that we do to, to basically optimize the, the images that we're sending over to the systems, like the channels, Shopify, eBay, things like that. Also with that said, a lot of those systems have their own optimization and dimension resizing as well. So uh, with that said, we don't see image dimensions, sizing, et cetera, as an issue very often. Um, so I know we've put some work in to certain scenarios. I know when I first joined on the inventory source side six years ago, there were more image questions and support issues we saw around images that I do remember several tasks that we've put in to kind of address those. Um, so I know there's some stuff going on in the back end. I can't speak specific uh, specifics around that, but... Um, it seems to not be an issue. And I know there's some resizing going across, across both our product and channels uh, algorithms as well at work. Um, that was Justin. Um, <clears throat> is there an API key that allows us to connect to your IS account, to our IS account from our dropship company to manage items via CSV? I have so many products not on site now that we need an overhaul. Thank you, Janine. Um, so, we do have the ability, FlexPoint specifically, where we can connect to your inventory source account. So if you have inventory source and you want to move over to FlexPoint and, and pull over all the products from inventory source um, and then start, you know, well, one, you can, I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding the question, but you can definitely do that. If, you, if that's the case, you want to connect your inventory source account and start managing in FlexPoint. The, the two manage items via CSV, I'm not really sure. Um, you know, if you want to move over and say you're managing items in inventory source, then you want to move over to managing a CSV file. You can certainly do that. You know, we are a data kind of management platform and you can switch over the input or output of that data. Um, so I don't see an issue there, but if you are uh, a current Janine, a current FlexPoint user, certainly enter a support ticket or, you know, you can obviously, um, you know, go to FlexPoint and just hit contact us. And if you're, if you're not a user yet, we can, we can talk you through how that would work. So a couple questions uh, slash things to talk about from Ahmed. I believe Ahmed's on today. Um, so awesome, happy to answer your question here live. Uh, and let me know, chat in here if, uh, if I don't fully answer it or if uh, I can clarify anything. So listing in bulk and knowing listings, <clears throat> listing stats from FlexPoint rather than the marketplace. Um, trying to think about what that, what we mean here. So listing in bulk and knowing listing status from FlexPoint rather than the marketplace. Um, so there is the, the concept of listing status in FlexPoint and showing that you're either listed or um, linked up, whatever it might be. Um, you know, really when you talk about listing status, it is, it does coincide directly with the channel. So if it's hidden on the channel, and you look at your listing in FlexPoint, we're going to show it as hidden because that's really what we, we thought of when we rolled out FlexPoint was we want to show you what's going on on your channel and that direct linkage there and that direct status connection in FlexPoint. So you have this one platform to view everything across multiple channels. You can look, this channel listing is listed on, on Shopify, but it's hidden on eBay and it's you know out of sync on Amazon. So those are a one-to-one -one kind of connection and, and um, sync there. Min-max pricing. So you can, you can account for min-max pricing 
um, with the pricing rules. Um, this is going to be based on certain data that we have in our system or that you input directly. Like you can say set to, uh, you know, when, when you create a workflow for pricing and you have different rules within that workflow, you could basically say, you know, if it goes over, you know, if it's in category t-shirts and it goes over $30, set to $30. Put that as a rule at the very bottom, I believe, in, and it says it there in the workflow screen, but I think it's the last, the very bottom is the last one it checks. If not, it will say it's the very top one, but fairly certain it's the, it's the very bottom one. You can do, you know, all products mark up 20% off cost. For t-shirts, mark up 40% if uh, the t-shirt's black, right? And then at the very last, say, if the t-shirt, you know, price is over $50, you know, set to 45, right? That would be kind of how you can do like a max pricing. Um, it's not really going to do anything when it comes to like ceilings and floors when it comes to repricing. So that just to confirm that that's not what I'm talking about, right? Uh, we do integrate with repricers like um, Excelco and uh, Inform.co and things like that to be able to help set min and max pricing there, you know, if you're repricing on Amazon. But those are just two examples of how we can kind of support that. Reports on inventory management. You know, I'd love to know more about the needs here on, on what, you know, I think there's one report we're looking at here and, and kind of like a stock replenishment report, you know, what products are under, you know, zero quantity or under the quantity of five and, um, you know, are, are under our internal source that you want to replenish them. Today, you can do that essentially by going to your inventory screen, going to manage filters, creating a new save filter and just putting together a filter. And it's essentially a report within your inventory. If it's, if it's more about like what's the most profitable item or what, you know, uh, has sold the most, like a sales report, uh, you certainly can see that in our, our uh, profit, I believe it's in the sales report, uh, product performance report that's in there as well. So um, that's one. I would say any requests you have around inventory management reports, I would love to hear from them. <clears throat> Either post them here as a suggestion in the chat. Uh, you can email me as well, travis at flexpoint.com if you have any requests around uh, inventory management reports that we can help you out with. Um, a few questions from Ransford. How do I find what products the consumers are buying, not just searching for? Um, so we don't, we have the, if it's, if you're pertaining, uh, let me step back. So if you're asking about data that we have, your sales, right? Which I'm not sure if you are, I, I can clarify, but if you're talking about your sales orders that you're getting, then we obviously have order reports that you can run and you can do filters on the order screen to kind of get an idea of like, you know, certain products that are selling more product performance report. Honestly, if we talk about products is probably the best. Um, other software out there that would take all data and, and data from Amazon and uh, different places like that. I think Keepa is like one of the top ones that you can look at trends and, um, Jungle Scout as well gives you like an estimated sales uh, volume based on bestseller rank and things like that. Uh, so those are those are other software platforms out there that help you kind of look at, you know, Amazon data is what they're typically using because that's really the only data you're going to have. And so, um, you know, that's just something to look at. All right, let me look at a couple of these. Do you recommend any commerce service? So this is actually a good one. Yeah, so also from, from Rance right here, do you recommend an e-commerce site for product sales and a WordPress site for your blog? And is a blog necessary for success? Love that question. It's a great question because, you know, five years ago, I bet you'd get different answers um, from different people and maybe still, obviously still today. But I would say you can have, and I would recommend having them both on one, given you feel good about the SEO capabilities, plugins, there's no major issue holding you back on your store uh, that's kind of a loaded answer what are the seo implications and issues right so if you want to create engaging content most platforms allow you to create pretty good engaging content you know and, and from an seo perspective that typically just means really well formatted laid out proper title tags um you know and then obviously it's up to you to create good content that's better than the next embed a video embed a podcast link to the proper relevant articles and then get backlinks that's that's how you win seo is creating great content better than the next person making sure that it's structured in a way that, you know, the keywords you're trying to rank for 
are, you know, uh, pre prevalent prevalent in the uh, in the actual blog post and on the uh, in the H1 tags tag tags and titles, right? And meta descriptions were written well, and you're getting clicks. People are staying on it. That's that's number one. Um, where you might run into hiccups and why this might in the past been an issue is whether the way that the handle or the permalink is generated um, and managed from a certain store might, you know, not be SEO friendly. Uh, it might be that um, in general, your page, your, your, your site loads slow, which page speed is, is a big thing. Um, the content, because you can't create, you know, there might not be really good content creation tools and that might not appear great or the, the markup language and the, the, the meta descriptions and things like things like that in the back don't really kind of add up. I'd say today, most of these platforms, I know Shopify has made huge strides and they're actually adding a lot more just in their recent unite conference. They mentioned a lot of a folk, a lot more focus on the, the blogging and content uh, creation side. So I'd say Shopify WordPress, you know, WooCommerce is a good combination obviously too, but Shopify is catching up pretty quickly to where it's negligible on what you can do from a blogging perspective uh, with Shopify versus with where's comp WooCommerce and WordPress combo that I don't think it's worth just the management headache, um, the domain redirects and, and just the, the fact of using two different platforms. Um, I could be wrong. There could be a, a huge advantage, but it's honestly all relative and, and, uh, you know, each person can be a little bit different. You create good content and you've got just the, the standard boxes checked as far as technical on-page SEO, which most of these platforms should have all these boxes checked by now, big, big commerce and Shopify at least, right? Um, then I think you'll be fine. So I would say one is fine. And then is a blog necessary for success? No, it's not. Um, if you, I think the, the value is if you do having make SEO a big part of your strategy, creating good content, a blog is one of the best ways to do that and, and get ranked for certain keywords. I think, um, you know, blogging in general adds more personality to your website. It adds more value and it can help co increase conversions, but that, you know, that's debatable. Um, and uh, yeah, if it's part of your strategy, then then it's obviously going to be part of your success. But if it's not, and you have a completely different strategy, I mean, there's tons of people in Oberlo that make a ton of money and flip Shopify websites and you never even look at their blog. You just look at one product page and that's it. And they were successful in their own right. So, um, you know, it's all relative when it comes to how you envision your success. <clears throat> all right. A couple others here. Uh, let me check in and see. Uh, here's one coming through. And that's my push on this toilet. Yep. So this question is mostly around the difference between inventory source and flex point. And if inventory source is different than flex point, um, specifically around Amazon and how to match to certain ASINs and can you match to multiple ASINs and things like that. So um, the way that this works, and I think this is the genesis of this question, the way that we both inventory source and flex point works is that we will send up a UPC or an ASIN to Amazon in our request, in our integration. And we'll say, we wanna list this item on this user seller central. And when we do that, Amazon will say, that's great. Here's a unique ID. We've found this, if it's a UPC, it'll look to multiple ASINs that are associated with that UPC. It's unfortunate that there'll be multiple ASINs, but there, there are because that's how Amazon works. It allows anyone to create an ASIN. Anyone can add a UPC. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So. In some cases, you may, um, you know, get a UPC that we send to Amazon. Amazon decides to pick the wrong ASIN. So to avoid that, you can send the ASIN, and then that is a one-to-one. -one. I know this ASIN. I want to list this product on that ASIN, right? And so you can do that in both inventory source and FlexPoint. Um, <clears throat> neither tool can you list one product to multiple ASINs, I don't believe, today in FlexPoint. If you could do it anywhere, it would be FlexPoint. Um, so that, that part is, is also the same. Um, I will say to the point of like Matt, like linking up to gated categories and stuff like that. Um, you know, we're going to, we're going to list these products. We're going to bring back uh, error messages uh, when we try to link or send an item to something that you don't have 
approval to, to list on. So, you know, FlexPoint has a little bit more error messaging, I believe, it, it, as far as differences. Like if we were to say list this grocery item, and I believe grocery is a gated category, um, and Amazon has determined that UPC, that ASIN we sent is in the grocery category, then you're not going, you know, we're going to get a little bit more error messaging back, but FlexPoint Inventory Source are both, neither one's going to be able to list a product that you don't have privileges to list. So um, just something to think about there. <clears throat> and then the error reports that we're kind of at the mercy of Amazon to bring back, you know, what the error is. Um, inventory source does lack kind of the error reporting on what that is. And that usually is kind of viewed by this uh, support team. FlexPoint's got a little bit more um, robust error messaging on here's what the actual error was gated versus non-gated or restricted item or brand restriction or whatever it might be. Um, so hopefully that answers that. All right. Uh, next one I've got is EDI always better than FTP integrations from, from Nicholas. Um, yeah. So it's, when we say better, it typically takes longer and it's typically more expensive to set up. But if we're talking about better as in more reliable, more timely, right? More accurate inventory. Um, those two specifically, right? From the order side, uh, you know, sending orders that we know in most cases, the supplier is going to have a automated process to handle tracking, same, same thing. Um, Yes, it is better because if you think about, you know, EDI and API integrations typically require a developer to help configure and, and build those. Um, FTP is a flat file, typically on a, ser on, a, on a FTP server. And so, you know, these are a little bit more kind of like a poor man's EDI, if you will, um, where that really means that you can essentially send a file uh, over an FTP. No developer needs to do anything. Um, it's fairly easy to just, you know, upload a file to an FTP. And then now this supplier can take this FTP down, do something with it. Maybe you're lucky enough that they have like an automated process to pull down that file from the FTP, automatically add it to their system. But typically if it's FTP and not API or EDI, an FTP can mean that there's a manual process behind the scenes from the supplier. So it can be open to manual um, you know, issues, right? Which is like duplicate entry or just misentry or uh, just being slower than the EDI API orders coming in. So it is always better to do API and EDI, but with that said, um, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna have to pay for it and it's gonna take a little more time and effort up front. So it's worth starting with a more simple method and then, you know, going from there if you can and, and then implementing. So a, here we go, FlexPoint has a lot of overlapping functionality with my ERP. How can your team help me figure out what I should be doing in, I guess it says ERP verse, versus flex point. Yeah, what I should be doing in the ERP versus flex point. Uh, that's from Ashley. Um, so Ashley, I would say that, you know, outline what you're looking for. Like, why are we looking at flex point today? What does your ERP do today? Um, I will say that flex point is typically going to be better than your ERP in the vendor management the, the inventory management of multiple uh, vendors and products across multiple vendors, um, the listing of inventory uh, to, to sales channels and marketplaces, right? We're gonna be better in that order management, inventory management flow. Um, when it comes to accounting and, um, you know, a little bit more kind of like reporting, I think there's a lot of ERPs are gonna do a little bit more there. There, you know, a lot of ERPs are focused around accounting um, and some inventory management, right? But uh, there might be some more reports and accounting kind of functionality ERP that a lot of times we're going to look to sync with an ERP. Um, when I say sync, you know, we have an exposed API. You can easily uh, just, you know, integrate your ERP to our API and then bring the data over that you would need. Um, you know, we see a lot of cases where like NetSuite is a very common ERP in the e-commerce space where we've integrated with NetSuite in cases that they need to use that NetSuite, their customer needs to use they want our, our drop ship, our integration capabilities, our order routing capabilities, our inventory management, whatever it might be. And so we'll integrate directly to NetSuite. We've seen other cases, you know, much more cases where someone goes, I bought NetSuite. It's, it's overkill for what I need it to do. Um, you know, it's, it's too expensive or too clunky or too, you know, just too much. It does, it does everything, but it's just too much for me. 
um, you know, we've seen people completely replace it with, with FlexPoint. So not saying that works for everyone. So we are open and flexible enough to work with NetSuite and integrate with them. Or if, if you don't see the need in NetSuite, we can certainly fill that gap. Um, that's the kind of way to think about it. If you, if you see the need to keep your ERP, which is, in case, is usually the case, um, we can always, you know, we have an open API to, to take the data that you get in our system and move it to the ERP. Um, you know, that's, that's one way of looking at it. You also looking at it as an extension of keep bringing everything into your ERP, all your sales channel information, sales orders, inventory order, inventory information, all that. And then when it gets to a integrated vendor or integrated warehouse or dropship supplier, when it gets to that, we pick up a purchase order, you know, or the full order, whatever you decide to configure from NetSuite, and we will be that extension to your vendor network. Um, we've seen that we've seen people implement NetSuite or other ERPs in that way as well, in addition to the other, you know, just mirroring the data. Um, a new question or a few questions from Jason. Have you always been in the e-commerce software market? Uh, so me personally, um, I've been in the e-commerce software market for, well, about eight years. Uh, I ran a marketing agency where we did consulting around e-commerce software. Um, we didn't have a platform. We had a, a we didn't have a product. We kind of had a, a service platform um, in my past company. So about nine years, actually, I should say. Um, so I did that for about three years. And then uh, we've been, I've been with Inventory Source and now FlexPoint for six years. So it's been about, about a decade. Um, and then did some, some uh, cloud migration, Google Apps, Google Workplace, um, or what do they call it now, Google Workspace uh, migration stuff prior to that. What do you think the future of SaaS will be in the next 10 to 20 years? Well, I mean, you know, who is it? Uh, Mark Andreessen, the whole software eating the world. I mean, basically SaaS software interchangeable, right? It's basically, it's just going to be pervasive in everything we do. Um, it's going to replace a lot of things that, you know, we, we do manually today. Um, a lot of SaaS apps, you've heard people say, you know, it's just like a, just, it's a, a UI on top of a spreadsheet. And I think that's a funny way to look at it is that anything you're using for a spreadsheet now today is there should, there's probably going to be a specialized domain specific app around that. Um, you know, spreadsheets are super flexible and really easy to get going. Everyone knows them, but there's a lot of missing in that, in that wide breadth and, and flexibility of, of a spreadsheet um, that a, a more dedicated SaaS app on top of it is going to be there. So honestly, you know, I don't know if spreadsheets will ever go away, but when I talk about the, the future of the SaaS market in the next 10 to 20 years is think about everything you're doing first with a spreadsheet and leave all these little micro use cases sitting on top of it. That will be the, a bunch of SaaS, SaaS apps will replace all those use cases that you're using a spreadsheet for today. Um, you know, and, and you'll still have spreadsheets, I'm sure for years on end for, uh, you know, just to have that flexibility of spinning up something new that hasn't or doesn't make sense to have a dedicated purpose for and then you're even seeing spreadsheets becoming blurring the line with SaaS apps. Airtable is a great example. There's other ones out there as well. So be interesting. SaaS in general, um, you know, software as a service in general, next 10, 20 years, uh, it's just going to continue to explode. The revenue model in, in general has been, um, you know, why we really define SaaS. It's no longer this kind of hosted on premise side of things. It's, we're already pretty mature in that model and, and the SaaS ecosystem. But seeing how that grows, um, it's just going to grow exponentially. I think it will be, you know, the de facto way to buy software. Uh, and it essentially is now, but I have, I have to look at the numbers. Honestly, it, it, if it's not in the high, high majority of software that's out there, and it might not be, I expect it to be in the next 10 to 20 years. I don't know how many people are still buying massive servers on five-year contracts. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. I, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> how can online sellers improve their fulfillment operations with automation? Um, yeah, so this one, uh, their fulfillment operations automation. So basically like anything else, like, like I was just talking about, SaaS will help you um, in our software specifically, will help you uh, take the manual process that really isn't efficient. And, and when it comes to fulfillment, that means like sending purchase orders to dropship suppliers, means fulfilling your own, uh, orders in house I means splitting up an order and deciding where it should go, whether it goes to you, a, a different supplier, or both. Um, you know, automating those processes. So, you know, how to improve, improve their fulfillment operations. It's really reducing errors when it comes to these manual processes, like 
sending POs, copy and pasting and tracking, updating inventory, stuff like that. Um, you know, it's really around that. It's, it's, it's taking more time. We have several people have come to us and said, I'm spending six hours a day doing these, these, and these, and, you know, basically things that we, we can help automate. So it's giving you time back, reducing the errors in the manual process and allowing you to just kind of, you know, gain a competitive advantage to, um, to fill quicker, improve customer experience because of that and, and reduce errors along the way as well. Okay. Um, the last one is, you know, it's a little bit off topic, but it's, it was one of, uh, it was a question. So I might as well answer it here. I mean, it's it, maybe it's maybe I'm thinking about it a different way, but Edith asked, talk about the benefits of migrating to AWS. So this is about, you know, I guess it, we did migrate to AWS. I'm not sure. Um, you know, if that, that's public knowledge or how Edith, you might've known about that, but we did go to AWS if that's what you're referencing here. Um, the benefits in general, what most co customers of AWS and most companies see is that now we're on this, you know, highly redundant, elastic cloud with data centers all over the world run by data center experts. And so FlexPoint, you know, is, was, was in the cloud. It was on an Oracle cloud. It was, you know, we had that kind of side of things, but now, you know, the, the ecosystem and the infrastructure that AWS has rolled out really allows us to, you know, say we've got, we have a customer now that's got 16 million products that we sync and that's not affecting any other customer's bandwidth or ability to, to sync inventory or how quickly their, their, uh, um, <clears throat> their page refreshes or whatever it might be, right? It's multi-tenant um, infrastructure and it's, and it's elastic and it can expand to a, a however many jobs and processes we need. Um, so we can constantly bring on new, more customers, infinite amount of customers, infinite amount of uh, product data and, and inventory, and it won't bog down one person versus the other. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a benefit of being able to migrate to AWS and, and really have the options that AWS has to, to set up this kind of elastic infrastructure. All righty. Cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was really all the questions we had um, come through today. Um, you know, really, I really appreciate this. I want to kind of open up to you guys and, and really answer anything that you might have had uh, in the past or if you have now. If you have something in the future, let me know. I'm happy to kind of answer questions via email. I'm, I'm open to, you know, I can't from a support perspective and product, deep product technical knowledge, right? I've got, you know, our team members here are really better suited for that, but feel free to shoot me an email. I'll get you in touch with the right person, Travis at flexpoint.com. Um, yeah, besides that, that's, uh, that's all I had today. So have a great day. Thanks for joining.